Behold Israel, when I started Behold Israel, was exactly uh, for type of scenarios like this. Stuff happened here. The world has no clue that it happens because the media, which by the way, I call them the Medianites, the media is completely biased and the truth is exchanged with lies. And to me, the story of Good Neighbor and even the story of our military career is something that has to be told. If you want to understand where we are, just take a look. Take a look at the fence and take a look at how close we are to the fence. This is Syria, right beyond it, right beyond this fence. I don't think any Israeli could be closer to Syria than this. Minefield from the left, mm -hmm. and minefield from the right. Basically, we're walking through a minefield. By the way, here it was also minefield. They clear this. They clear this one. Pave the road. So, yeah, you guys risk your lives in the narrow passage inside a minefield that the Syrians put here many, many years ago, in order to save Syrians' lives. Isn't that? It? I mean, to me, this is almost like. Unreal. Here we are. We are right now walking through. I mean, people need to to see. There's a there's a sign here that says danger mines. <laughs> I'm not going to cross this one. There's a minefield right here, and on the other side, there's a sign that says danger mines. There's another minefield right there. We are walking through a safe area in, in inside a minefield, and this is. I guess, where you guys brought the Syrian uh, wounded people yeah. from. So just take a look, it's 150 meters from the fence. I actually see a house in Syria right now, is that right? Yeah, this is a house in Syria, and you can see where is the big antenna. Yeah. It was an Al-Qaeda base. This antenna standing there was an Al-Qaeda Al base. Al-Qaeda base, wow. they captured it from the UN. We are going down the fence, opening the fence in order to provide aid. You can see the huge um, fence. And then understand Al-Qaeda is watching you. So Al-Qaeda is there. The civilian population is over there. That's the fence right here. Two kilometers to the south, it was an area controlled by ISIS. So ISIS, <laughs> Al-Qaeda, Jabhat al-Nusra, Hezbollah. All, all the best friends. Yes. Minefields on both sides. And all of these obstacles did not stop you. Did not stop us. In a way, even by reporting that, right now, we're risking our lives. Exactly. So the Lord told Abraham, get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And this is exactly why we came to this abandoned military bunker from the early 70s. A bunker that was built by the Israeli military after the Yom Kippur War. And we are with Lieutenant Colonel in reserves, Eyal Dror, Shalom Eyal. Shalom, nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. In fact, we just found out not long ago that we served in the same unit for a, sh a short period. Um, not at the same time though, of course. And you have a tremendous story uh, that basically shows how this nation, this nation that is in this part of the world is indeed a blessing to the nations around it. Where are we first and why are we here? So we are at the southern part of the Golan Heights, at the point we call it in the military 116 checkpoint. This is an Israeli bunker, but it is also a place that located 300 meters from the Syrian border very close there. And on this specific area, it was one of the biggest parts of the operation that I led a couple of years ago, the humanitarian operation and the assistance to the Syrian people. 
So what is the background story of the uh, Israeli-Syrian border over the last 10 years? So Amir, in order to answer your question, I will take you 40 years ago, because some of the audience know that it was a terrible place in a terrible war between Israel and Syria back at the 70s, the Yom Kippur War. Personally, for example, my father cousin, who was also a lieutenant colonel in the IDF, a commander of a battalion, lost his life on Mount Hermon, which is 60 kilometers north into this point. But since the end of that war, for 40 years, it was a very quiet border. Unfortunately for the Syrians, back in 2011, something bad happened. The Syrian civil war started as part of the Arab Spring. A terrible war. One million people lost their lives. Six million became refugees. They had to escape from their homeland. And on the border, we saw 250,000 human beings, which their homes has been destroyed. People who are living without electricity, without water, with very short food. This was the situation in the last 10 years that Israel thought we should respond. Wow, so Israel cared about those that live on the other side of the border, but what was your role in this whole story? I was the commander of the biggest humanitarian operation led by the IDF, Operation Good Neighbor. Today, three years after the operation came to an end, I can say that I was privileged to be the commander of this uh, operation. Wow, so you led the largest humanitarian aid that the Israeli Defense Forces ever extended to our neighbors around. And this is while the other side is still hostile. It's not like the, the, the most peaceful place in the world. How did it all start? One morning somebody wakes up and decides, hey, I want to help them. What really happened? So first of all, you're correct. This situation on this border was that Israel and Syria are in a hostile situation. The Syrian regime is our enemy. It was terrible clashes in the history between the two countries. However, when we saw the Syrian civilians, who are not connected to the Syrian regime, suffer so much, and although it was an internal civil war between them, and although in this area it was captured by some of our best friends, let's call it ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Hezbollah, all the organizations that swear to kill us, the Israelis, to murder the Jews, Israel decided that we cannot sit behind a fence and to see people massacred. And this was the understanding that we should help the Syrians. Now, it all began back in 2013, while a little bit north into this uh, area, some Israeli soldiers in the middle of the night saw some Syrians coming close to the border fence. Try to imagine the situation. 18, 19 years old boys, soldiers in the IDF, seeing Syrians coming closer to the fence. They have no intel about them. They do not know if they are terrorists. They do not know if they are people who is coming to the border in order to collect some intelligence about the Israeli soldiers. However, those soldiers saw that they are wounded and they decided to open the border fence. On the spot? On the spot. It was a tactical decision, not a government decision at that time, to open the border fence based on their values as soldiers, as Jews, that if someone want help, you should help him. So they take a huge risk to their lives, open the border fence, and save those people's lives. This was the first time it was a contact between Israelis and Syrians. And since that day, we continued night by night to serve humanitarian aid to the Syrians. So the locals knew that the Israelis would actually help them. By the way, I, mu I must say that Syrians were educated for years that we are the enemy. 
we are called by the Arabs, some of the Arab countries, some of the Arab leaders, as the small devil. So the Syrians knew and they were afraid from us. But from that night in 2013, while those Syrians came back, it was clear that Israel is not the enemy. That Israel is willing to help. And every night, for three years, they came to the border and Israel gave those life-saving treatment. And in 2016, the IDF decided to establish the project we are just speaking about, the Good Neighbor Project. So it took us three years from the moment the first wounded Syrian approached the border and was treated differently than what he thought. Three years it took to the Israeli side to decide that we actually want to make it a national project, not just one by one thing. Exactly. It took us the three years for the Israelis and for the Syrians. Wow. During those years, we built the trust. trust. Yes. The Syrians understood that Israel is not the enemy and they understood that we are willing to give them help. Mm. Operation Good Neighbor, why I was chosen to serve the, as the commander to establish that program, my mission was to increase dramatically the humanitarian aid provided by Israel to the Syrian side. It means not just saving lives, but to think about all the opportunities that we can do in order to help those wow. people. So here you are, arriving here on the first day. What was that first day like for you? Wow, very emotional. Because at this point, exactly, on August 2016, we did our first operation. By the way, I'm always using the term a humanitarian operation, not a mission, operation, because when you are as a soldier going down the fence and know that the enemy is watching, is a military operation. Now, back at August 2016, we are arriving in this area with a thought that we want to bring to Israel 50 people, 25 children, with their mothers. Those children suffering from chronic diseases, like diabetes, for example, ear problems or eye problems, and we are going the fence, seeing on the other side the light of a car, calling our colleagues to come closer to the border fence. Now, the adrenaline is very high because... And it's all at night time. Night time. So we're 3 a.m. We're not talking about anything in the daylight. I mean, no, no, when no. the night falls, the action starts. Exactly. Wow. Exactly. The night is a very close friend. So you are going there at the night. By the way, it can be the summer, but it can be winter time. Winter here is brutal. And it's very rough, very cold, rainy. Um, and you open the border fence, and again, the adrenaline, because I think the gap between what you are doing and the risk is huge because you know that you are going to do something very good but you know that the enemy those al-qaeda Al isis might take advantage of this operation in order to hit your soldiers so the adrenaline is high and then you see the syrian children i'm a father of three children when i was the commander of this operation my biggest was just six years old and the, what I saw in that first night is something that you cannot forget. Because nothing prepared you for a girl crossing the border fence barefoot and her legs are bleeding. It's something that, and I'm not speaking from the position of a lieutenant colonel. I'm speaking from a position of a father, a human being. You cannot accept this. This was the first operation. This was the first time. 25 children and their 25 months. children. Taking wow. them to one of the Israeli hospitals. I'm thinking about the fathers left back home and what do they think? Will we ever see them? Or, But I think at that point, it's three years after the first wounded was here. I think they trusted the Israelis more than they trusted their own. Yeah. <laughs> one of the stories in one of those operations, you know, out with my military uniform, with my weapon, and a Syrian boy is running between me and my soldiers when we were at the hospital. And I reached him and told him, aren't you afraid? We are soldiers, we have weapons. 
He started to laugh. He told me, you are not Syrian soldiers. You are Israelis. I'm not afraid from you. This is how you can see the way that they came to understand that Israel is not an enemy. And I sat with this, another Syrian boy and I asked him a very simple question, something that I'm usually asking my girls and boy. When you will be adult, what do you want to do with your life? Now my girl, well, she is, every time she's changing her mind, I'm sure that your kids also. I want to be a famous dancer, I want to be a famous lawyer. And this boy was looking at me with his sad eyes and he told me, I will not be an adult. Wow. I will probably die in a year or two. This is what happened to Syrian children. It's something that your mind as a human being cannot accept because at that time, myself and my soldiers, we all understood a very simple thing. We understood that, yeah, there is Jews and there are Muslims, there are Israelis, there are Syrians. Before everything, we are human beings. And we did the right thing to do as human beings. We helped people, we saved their lives, we gave them hope. I'm sure it changed also our lives, not just the Syrians. To know that you provided help for a person in need. 1,400 children were treated during this operation, during this part of the project. And they got back to Syria. They shared their experience with their families, with their hamula, with their relatives. Israel is not a bad country. And they shared those stories inside and the operation become bigger. More people wanted to enter Israel from faraway places, not from the villages one kilometer, even from villages 40 kilometers inside Syria, asked to be treated in Israel. Wow, that, that is amazing. And the operation kept growing and growing. How did it grow? I mean, from, from few children and mothers all the way to... We spoke about the children, it was 1,400. But I told you before that my mission was to increase the humanitarian aid. And I understood that the IDF cannot do it by itself. We found some NGOs, non-government organizations, that knows to do humanitarian aid. We found some Jewish organization, but the most surprising thing is we found Christian and even Muslim organization. Now, I don't know how many times in history, Jews and Christian and Muslims collaborate together. I'm almost sure that it never happened while they have an Israeli commander. This was our team, Jews, Christians, Muslims, working together under the command of an IDF, an Israeli soldier, officer, in order to save Muslims' lives. Wow. It's almost hard to believe that yeah, an Israeli officer commands Muslim Christians and Jews to help war-afflicted zone that is very hostile towards Israel. It was hard to believe even to the Muslims when they arrived in the first time to my home base. Imagine the scenario, a Muslim who were living in Syria, go out from Syria 30 years ago, he's an American yeah. citizen, but he's a Muslim, he's a Syrian, and he's meeting an IDF officer and start to collaborate with him. When we're speaking about the, those NGOs, so not far away from this position, where we are now sitting, less than a mile, an American organization built a field clinic, eight, thousand Syrians were treated in this wow. field clinic and I want to show you with your permission please I want that you will see how amazing this was wow the clinic, because, playground exactly it was pretty much built for children exactly so you will go to the doctor the doctor will examine your mother will do an ultrasound and will give her an, an antibiotic but the child will be able to play. The children will be able to jump and to feel again like children. Mm. Was there any great opposition and attack from, from the other side? I mean, no one on the other side wants Israel to, to look good. And no one on the other side, and I'm talking about our enemies, wants Israel to reap the fruits of, of all of this and to help and be the one who provides, you know, all the remedy for, for this situation. 
Yet, tell me, how many times were you attacked? Thanks God, we haven't been attacked. Not at all? Not at all. But this is not the question. How many times have we been attacked? How many times it was possible to our enemies to attack us? And they didn't. And they didn't. 700 times. 700 humanitarian operations. 700 times we chose as Israelis to risk our lives in order to provide aid. And when you say risk our life is going in? We should understand, we didn't go inside Syria. This is a state and as Israelis we don't want to be in Syria. We open the border fence and provide the aid. So every time you open the border, there was a potential of a terrorist attack or a sniper, a sniper or something. A missile, yeah. and a bomb. Nothing happened? Nothing happened. I can tell you that the Syrian regime, who were 20, 30 kilometers from that spot, they escaped because of the war. They didn't like it. They threatened their people that they... Not to come. Not to come. We knew that Al-Qaeda is watching. We knew that ISIS is watching. How come Al-Qaeda did not attack? Okay, I will tell you about Al-Qaeda. Okay. They are not our friends. They do not, not like they do not like Israel. Okay. We can agree about it. Yep. But when we built a project, by the way, a project cost 50 million shekels, it's a little bit less than five million dollars of a maternity hospital from A to Z. One thousand Syrian babies were born in this hospital. He was in one of the Syrian villages. We provide him by one of the NGOs all the equipment. And after a couple of months, the Syrian doctors built it. They informed me that they are going to do a celebration of opening the hospital. It was very amazing and because we knew that some, a huge project has been done. And a day after, the Syrian doctor called me. And we spoke and I asked him, how was the celebration? He told me, it was amazing. And I asked him, how many people were in this celebration? He told me, a couple of dozens. And I asked him who they were. He told me, everyone. So I asked him like a joke, will your friends from Al-Qaeda were there? And you know, uh, I knew that the answer will be no, of course, no. They denied Israel. They do not like Israel. Everybody knows that it is an Israeli project. So. Surprised, he told me, yes, they were. I was shocked and I asked him, how come they are Al-Qaeda? You don't have any Israeli flag on this hospital, but everybody knows that it is Israeli hospital. Israel built this hospital. And he told me, while we finished the celebration, this commander of Al-Qaeda reached to me and he told me, good job. You will continue to do this. Nobody will attack this hospital. And I told him, why he told you so? He told him, because his, his wife also want to give birth in a Western hospital, not at their home. <laughs> so again, even Al-Qaeda, who didn't like this project and didn't like Israelis, knew that the people mm. is earning something from this project. Everybody in the southern part of Syria knew that Israel is saving their lives every day. Wow. So I guess there was a great effect on the Syrian side. What was the effect on the Israeli people? I can tell about myself. It changed my life. I decided, for example, not to become a colonel in the IDF, but to retire, to spend more time with my family. I started today to understand all the obvious things that we have in our world and say thank you. When I'm speaking about obvious thing, I'm speaking about a story that a Syrian mom told me that how great is Israel? She was crossing and after an hour she was in Israel, I asked her about Israel. She told me you have a wonderful country and I asked her why. She told me because I was been in the bathroom and I wash the water and then I had cold and warm water in the sink. I don't have it in Syria. So you have a wonderful country. And I thought myself, oh, I never thought you about it. You have running water, that's it. You're I wonderful. never thought about it. We take things for granted, for don't granted. we? For granted. So 
I can tell you as a yard, it changed my perspective about life. Do more to help other people, but I can tell you that it changed the life of the soldiers, of the medical teams that saw the poor people in their toughest hours. Not everything is a duty. You know, you can do your duty, but you can do it even a little bit more if you understand that you are privileged to save life. And I had hundreds of talks with my soldiers about we became better human beings. How do you see this project influencing the future? Will it have any long-lasting influence? So the project unfortunately came to an end three years ago while the Syrian regime reconquered the area and the people that okay, were living So for operational surrounded. reasons, yeah, we from, couldn't continue. Exactly. Not, it's not like we change our minds. No, 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 not. But what I think, you know, we are living in a very complicated neighborhood, in the Middle East. Every day, things are happening here. I can assure you that the Syrians will not forget this operation. Isn't that interesting that when their government was out, we came in to help, and when their government stepped back in, we cannot help them anymore. Yeah. It's, it's mind-boggling. It destroyed the Syrian regime propaganda that Israel is the enemy. Exactly. I, I can also tell you that the life of those citizens today are even worse than it was in 2017. Yeah, they are not being bombed every day now, but their lives are very, very hard. But this is the Middle East. We are not forgetting. Correct. Things are, people will remind you things that happened 40, 50 years ago. This is the history of this place. I'm sure that the Syrian people will not forget us. A chapter and, was written. Exactly. A chapter in the history of the relationship between Israel and Syria has been written. One day, I don't know if it will be two years, five, 10, 50, 20 years, I think that we, the both sides will remember Operation Good Neighbor because when it will be discussion, and I believe in peace, I want to live in peace with my neighbors, mm -hmm. when something will be discussed, the both parts will speak about how Israel saved the Syrian yeah. lives. You know, it's so surreal. We're sitting, it's a very peaceful afternoon here, but I, I can't run away from this image in my mind based on what you told me earlier that I'm sitting right next to a plot a piece of land that is drenched with Syrian blood and hundreds of wounded people were lying right here right below where we sit and Israeli soldiers treated them and then took them to hospitals and brought them back the next evening and sent them back home. This is a, a message that if it is not going to be told the way we do it now, no one would ever believe it. I will just add one more detail to what you described. Israeli soldiers treated them by risking their lives. Exactly. Two memories that I want to share with you. Okay. First of one is a picture drew by a Syrian child. Wow. Now you will probably read the English. I prefer to read it in Arabic. the authentic language. Shukran Israel al al musaada wal hub. Wow. Thank, Thank you, you Israel for the help and for the love. By the way, this is the meaning of Operation Good Neighbor. Something that was behind if an imagination, impossible a mm. couple of years ago, and become reasonable. But this is not the most exciting thing that I cherish from Operation Good Neighbor. What else? I want to show with you the story of the flag of Israel. All right. I think you can guess that it is not an adult drew this. Yeah, I can definitely guess that one. And I want to show with you the story about Weham. Weham. Weham, a Syrian girl, nine years old, Weham were living in a village and suffered from severe diabetes. And one night we went to the border and we 
took her to the Israeli hospital. We know from our colleagues that there is a girl in severe danger to her life. The Israeli doctors, while we were reaching the hospital, told me that 24 hours later she wouldn't have survived. Now she spent here six months. Wow. Six months. The Israeli doctors fought for her life and they won. And before she went back to Syria, she asked us how to do the flag of Israel and she tried. And, and you that can was see the yeah, process. Yeah, she, she tried and it was amazing to, to observe her how she's fighting to, to do the Star of, the David, star of yeah. David. And eventually she that's succeeded. The victory. To see an Israeli flag in Arab country is a rare thing, and to even hear the word Israel, it's a rare thing, and yet the, those children, they got it right. They will not forget They will never forget it. What an amazing way that God has used the Jewish people and the people of Israel to be as a light unto the nations and the Gentiles all around them, even to their enemies. What a great blessing to have you here. Thank you very much. Thank you.